I am Davey Bushnock, your host, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but you already I heard from we her. We need to leave that at the beginning of the episode. Oh, it's going to oh, stay. Yeah. And I'm Drew Meyer. Yes. Hi. And today we are reviewing... Um, Tomb of the Cybermen! The Tomb of the Cybermen re-release. Yes. Re-release. Um, special edition. Yes. That was done with the... I think they talked about it on the back of here. I forget what the name of the Extra technology. stuff. Well, no, no, no. Lots no. of stuff. Two discs! No, what is... The, oh, the, the Vidfire um, technology. Gotcha. To help improve the quality of the DVD to make it look like how it looked upon transmission. This is actually the only surviving episode, or full, full story, story um, that exists from the fifth season of Doctor Who. That's true. Which is very, very sad after um, watching this. Because um, i got to say, Victoria, I think she jumps up on my list of companions to possibly my favorite. I want to see her story favorite. before with that big dress on. Oh, I actually just finished listening to Evil of the Dialects. I don't want to listen to it. I want to see it with that big dress on. There's actually a surviving episode. Of course, I'm cutting everybody off here. Um, in the Lost Time uh, DVDs, which I actually have those. Right. Yeah. There's a couple of those. Um, yeah. One of the other fun things about it, too, is even though uh, you haven't seen it, there is a uh, David J. Howe book that came out think in the early 90s called Companions, which is just a collection of information on the individual actors. Mm -hmm. Not specifically their companions, but the actors themselves. And there's some wonderful photographs that are publicity shots as well as head shots. And um, yeah, they were wildly impressive. Um, interesting thing about the Tube of the Cybermen, when I first decided to start watching Doctor Who from start to finish, I didn't have a copy of Unearthly Child. And the first uh, DVD I could get my hands on was Tomb of the Cybermen. So Tomb of the Cybermen was my introduction to my reintroduction to Classic Who. So that's kind of what I watched first. So of all the Classic Who's, this is the one I probably remember the least because I watched this, then went back to Hartnell with uh, 10,000 BC and Running for the Child. Yeah, and it's interesting that the only reason why we even have this complete story is thanks to uh, Britain and their colonization of other countries. Well, and the um, fact that they sold all the episodes to other countries as well. Exactly. Um, but the we the reason why we ended up with this, and they actually quickly released it once they had their hands on it, was they found, they found it in Hong Kong. Right. And they basically turned around and got a, got a version of this out, um, which I find absolutely fascinating. But it made total sense because at one time Hong Kong was a colony of... Uh, Britain, and I just totally, when I first read that fact, I was like, wow, that's um, Makes sense. really interesting. So, what did you guys think of Tomb of the Cybermen? Overall. Overall. Um, the tricky thing about Tomb of the Cybermen, and just shows in general, is when I watched it, I hadn't been acclimated to how Doctor Who presents itself. I'm, you know, having watched it as a child and kind of forgotten about it and then watched our new Who episodes, mm -hmm. these fast-paced, 40-minute, quick, get to the plot, do your thing, amazing special effects, and then you get to Tomb of the Cybermen, <laughs> and the Cybermats, which are adorable. I, they are adorable. Uh, <laughs> I still think the BBC needs to make a mouse 
of a cyber mat. That is brilliant. Yeah. You heard it here first. Yes. Yes. Actually, I think Copyrights. I said it on, on an older episode, I made Possibly. that comment. It might, it might have been when we did the... It was um, the one in the mall. When they did the, yeah. the mall episode. Because I said where I think they, they need to make a little mouse of it. Sure. They brought back right. Closing Great. time. Yeah, closing well, time. Well, uh, you know, the cyber mats, this is the first time we're introduced to the cyber mats yes. and anything that we're, that's surviving. Um, but this is this is also the first cyber mats. The cyber mats have <laughs> gone through four iterations since then. Um, with Attack of the Cybermen, the first uh, Doctor Who released on VHS yeah. publicly, um, the <laughs> cyber mats are actually uh, these elongated. They look like um, handbags. Yes. Um, they're pretty sinister, actually. I think more so than than they are here. And then, of course, we have our newer versions. And there was, I think, one more in Silver Nemesis. But um, I liked it. Um, I thought the Cybermen actually, um, with Tomb of the Cybermen, and then going back and seeing some of the stills from the Tenth Planet, I thought the Cybermen were actually far more terrifying in these two early shows than they were in any other iteration. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see that. I mean, what I liked, I mean, I absolutely adore the Tomb of the Cybermen. I, I liked it more than I even could have hoped. Um, because I think this is the first time I, I saw it when it when it was released, um, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely um, since then now definitely doing the vidfire stuff. I'm not going back and buying anything that has not been vidfired because of the quality. Because mm -hmm. I mean, they show clips of what they had and what they did with vidfire, sure. and it's absolutely amazing. And so I'm looking forward to more of them with them going back and doing more of this stuff. But I mean, I think I think this was the smartest two, or the supplement I've ever seen. They set a trap. Sure. They set this giant elaborate trap to find who's going to be the next cy cyber controller. The one that could solve the 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 puzzles they, they've laid out in with the people that are trying to resurrect them, not realizing it's a trap. And I was just like, wow. I mean, that is some great storytelling. Sure. Yeah. You, you think it's a, you think it's a tomb, but in the end, it turns out not to be a tomb. It's a giant trap. And it also kind of starts this love-hate relationship that the Doctor has with archaeologists. Yeah, um, <laughs> actually, yeah. There's, there's a number of archaeologist yeah. stories, and it, it is kind of brilliant. He never mentions this until um, kind of the introduction of River Song yeah. in, in the, the fourth season. You who? Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this is the first archaeologist I think I remember in uh, certainly of Troughton, but probably of any of the first two Doctors. Now that I'm thinking about. It, I, I think you're right. I think this is the first time he's interacted with an archaeologist. And they weren't that bright, um, if I can remember. Um, yeah. uh, just no one in this storyline really shines as a beacon of intelligence. Um, maybe... Like, all the way down to just opening the door at the beginning of the episode, the guy just dies. Yeah, yeah, this is... And this then she is... has her manslave. Like, her manslave! Yes! <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that was... That was really interesting. Because yes. I think he only has one line in the entire thing. There's a wonderful, um, and one of the reasons that I, I buy Doctor Who, now I'm only going to be mm -hmm. buying the ones with our nice little purple uh, blast logo there um, because of the, the great quality of the Yeah. Doing. But the, <clears throat> yeah. the special editions, just the interviews and the documentaries, to me, I think a lot of people make this mistake, and I certainly was guilty of this, is thinking that these older Doctor Whos are laughable. Um, because of production values mm -hmm. and, and wobbly walls and rubber costumes. Yeah. Uh, but to understand... The saran wrap that they come through and pull open. Sure. Ah, oh, that's like the best part. The oh, it's wonderful. Up. I love it. It's wonderful, and it's iconic. They've, rep they've done that several times mm -hmm. since. But there's a wonderful um, documentary for the mutants, um, mm -hmm. much later, later Pertwee, um, kind of one of the early James Atchison costumes, too. Um, that talks about uh, minorities in roles in Doctor Who, and here's one of our first appearances of a black character, and of course he's essentially a mute sla uh, man slave. Yeah. Um, uh, it was the '60s, maybe. But I'll, I'll say this: even though he is the, the the mute, you know, man slave, he actually plays a very big part of in the overall story. It just wasn't like he was set dressing. It wasn't like he was just the mute man servant. He, I mean, he, he does a lot in the episode, um, and that's really interesting. Because the second time I'm watching with the info text, I'm like, that man never speaks. <laughs> and they, they actually talk about him. I mean, he actually had a very successful career as a black actor in England at the time. Which is 
hard to to accomplish it, especially yeah. at the time. I have not gotten a chance to watch this special edition, so I've only watched the original release, and I haven't watched it with yeah. the info because I didn't even realize that, that existed when I first started watching the DVDs. Yeah, um, like my original set of Key to Time, the, ba the Baker season, Ugh. is it isn't the the new special editions they did because I bought it on the original release. And I, I'm loving the um, special editions. My key to time won't even play on my v, uh, DVD player. I have to watch them on a laptop because for whatever reason, my DVD player does not recognize the discs from key to time. Ooh. So what did you think of the episode overall? I love this. It was hokey in the fact that their costumes and stuff are just fabric. And if you watch them today and then you watch them then, you can kind of chuckle at the costuming. But also... The, the whole story when they're waking up and they're pushing through and they're trying the actors are trying so hard to make it seem like it's so hard and then they pull through that plastic wrap and pull it apart and it's great it's just so much fun and the little cyber mats were really cute and everything being filmed backwards yes yeah one of the interesting things about this uh and, and that shot that you're speaking of where, the, where they're breaking through is um they, the way they used to uh, the, the film the episodes, um, they laid everything out beforehand before they, you know, put up sets, they figured out the camera direction, and they quickly discovered that um, when they built the sets, they put them in the wrong spot. And you really, back then with those cameras, you couldn't move them. I mean, they were pretty much where they were on those things, so they literally had to take a day, half a day, take it all down, reshift it to where it was supposed to be mm. for the camera. Um, and talking about the costumes, one of the interesting things that people have brought up in retrospect, because if you, you can actually look at the evolution of the Cyberman costume. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Where in some of the original, I mean, like first stories, they were they were mostly fabric and they were more human. Mm -hmm. And little by little, they, they call this sort of the evolution, they became more and more machine. Sure, of course. And I think, I think that's just absolutely fascinating that they, I mean, of course, I, the original why it wasn't, you know, all hard costume pieces was they couldn't afford it yeah i mean come on there were how many like 10 of them not even that many yeah, i don't think in that but it, but it's kind of cool that you know oh, like you could use that. that uh that lack of budget to sort of add a story a story element to the revolution as a creature sure and i've said this before <laughs> I, I will constantly say it i am absolutely in love with doctor who these first two with the first two doctors when you understand that what you're essentially watching is a four-act play, each oh, episode, yeah. it's it's start to finish. These are these are stage actors. This is not fast cuts. This is not special effects. They don't have special effects. They have costumes, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. If you screw up a line, or for instance, if William Hartnell just goes off on a tangent, it's up to everyone else to just cover it play because along. you cannot edit this. Editing was quite literally film. You had to cut the yeah. film, put it back together, and run it again. Which is how they, I mean, even at this time, that's how a lot of movies were made. Because yeah, if you watch any old Jackie Chan movies, that's exactly how they would edit all sure. the Hong Kong movies. Yeah. yeah. And that, I mean, that's a great thing is, I mean, I think we got such strong supporting cast, especially during Hartnell, is they made sure they had somebody that could play off of Hartnell when he, when he flubbed his lines. Mm -hmm. Because like, the actor who played Ian Chesterton was really good at that um, he was, improv. He was an improv. He was an improver. Yeah. And he um, had to. He with, had to. With Hartnell. And, and they purposely put him in that part to play off that fact that they knew Hartnell was at times just going to go off on his own little tangent. But it's so great, just any of these old shows. Like you watch old Doctor Who or Dark Shadows or anything, and when they flub a line, they're just like, well, well, and this, and this, and this, and this. And all the other actors are like, yes. <laughs> Another thing that makes Tomb of Cybermen so important is that this is the very first surviving um, yeah. Troughton episode. Mm -hmm. So if you want to watch Troughton on DVD, you this is where you start. This is where you start. And it's a really good episode. Um, yeah. You have a classic villain, um, yeah. albeit in a, a very early setting for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Socks, flashlight. Actually, that's more of Tenth Planet. But um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's really interesting. One of the special effects they did have on this was the, the cyber leader. Um, he has this dome sort of head, and... The poor actor, it was it was battery packed up and stuff, and that thing was supposed to be pulsating, oh, right. but it did not come through on on film. They could see it on stage and when it, or on set when it was working or not working, but when it came over to film, the effect is not there at all because this didn't have 
the the camera capabilities that we have nowadays. They didn't have HD back then. No. And of course, which means you have to have this extra um, special effect into the costuming where you have a battery pack yeah. and that's got to be heavy. And this is something that any documentary you watch on the Cybermen, it's just rife with this kind of, well, we wanted to show their jaws to show that they're actually yeah. Cybermen. We painted them silver, but then things started falling out of their helmets and dangling yeah. in the middle of recording. So we put this plastic piece there so you couldn't see their jaws anymore. Oh, okay, well that's, that's how that happens. Yeah. So, again. Movie magic back then. Movie magic. And of course, um, the, the first and, and only surviving with Deborah Watling and um, yeah. uh, uh, are, are McCrimmon. So, Jamie McCrimmon, which yeah. uh, is of the original and classic Doctor Who's the longest running companion for any of the Doctors. Yeah. Um, and who really nice guy. I've, I had a chance to meet him at Dragon Con two years ago. And he was nothing but, I mean, he was letting people take his picture without charging, you know, the $50 price or the $20 price. I mean, he was just like, he would take pictures with anybody. I mean, he was just such, you know, a gentleman. And just really happy to, to have had his time on the show. Fraser Hines did not want to leave that program. Fraser Hines is very still much Jamie McCrimmon. Um, oh, yeah. I think, and I think he, he, he owns that. Um, uh, and thank you for that. Jamie, for yeah. whatever reason you decide to, or I'm afraid you have to watch this. I, I, I will say this: what's really interesting watching Jamie McCrimmon now, like in in the Patrick Troutman episodes, the original run, and then I'm gonna bring up the two doctors here, is that it's like he almost digressed in age in the two doctors. Haven't seen it, I, but I mean, he is such a fascinating character. I mean, I mean just. He's willing to go up against the doctor when he does not agree with them, and it's just absolute, just fascinating to watch or listen to. There's um, a digressing to the comic book, which I I know can and cannot be. There's some controversy about whether or not it's canon. Um, oh, uh, Moffat pretty much laid the groundwork that says it's all canon. He might have to change his mind there. When Grant Morrison decided to write Doctor Who, if you haven't <laughs> read them, they're pretty astounding. Um, we find out that the Cybermen are actually the evolved versions of the Vrood from the Key to Marinus. Really? Yes. And that they are, in fact, the Time Lords recognize the fact that the Vrood are going to um, evolve into the Cybermen. These bloodthirsty, horrible, and they allow them because eventually they will in themselves evolve into a much higher race alluding to that perhaps it might even be uh, the Time Lords. Um, but McCrimmon is pulled back as very, very young, uh, very old. Yeah. He's decrepit, and it's actually the death of Jamie McCrimmon uh, to, save, to save the Doctor from the... Um, from the it's, it's pretty cool. Interesting. Getting a chance to see some of these old comics, um, definitely take a look at those, because without budgetary constraints, the comic book can be pretty much any kind of Doctor oh, yeah. episode you want. And the same thing with the... the um, the radio dramas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, and there's some of those that I really wish that they would just make into episodes. <laughs> that is true. Yes. Um, and there's hundreds of them, so yes. that would be. Is there anything about To Miss Armament you don't like? I mean, I mean, we talk about how much we, we really, really like it. Um, personally, I can't think of a thing. I like I said, I absolutely adore this episode. You know what I don't like? I don't like it's the only existing story of the Second yeah. Doctor. That's what I don't. Like. Well, no, no, there are others that exist. Oh, from, that, I mean, from that season, from yeah, of course. From that season. Oh, there's some... Well, full story. There are bits and pieces, but sure. full story. From season five, yeah. Yes. I, it's been so long since I've seen it. It's been about nine months since I've seen it. Um, and I have watched 130... Yeah, this is 130 episodes pretty much since. Um, I can't specifically... I remember liking a lot of this um, and also going... Uh, I'll tell you what I don't like about it. I don't like the fact that um, the original black and whites are designed to be these long-running serials and they're, they're um, six to 14 parters. Yeah. Not, not that this one is. I think this was a six-parter. This was... It ran from September 2nd to September 23rd, 1967. Okay, so it's a four-parter? Uh, it's either four or five. Okay. I can't remember. I, I feel that in many ways, and I understand that that's how it was designed. I get that. I, I loved it in certain ways, but it was also some of these, you go, wow, they don't need to put that in there. Um, I mean, you could probably edit this down uh, to a three-parter and make it a really just stupendous thing, but that's, it's just a sign of the times, and I'm, I have grown to appreciate that more, but again, 
this being the first one I watched, yeah. I gotta say I was a little put off by it um, because, you know, I'm like, I got 40 minutes, let's watch this Dr. Who. Oh no, wait, it's still going. All right, but no, no, it's still continuing. Wow, okay, it's still going, all right. Um, and I would, will say that even though this was a good episode, there are some early Hart and Ellen Troutons that um, are not as good. Well, yeah. That, that when they appear in that, that serialized version, it's a little painful to watch. Well, I mean, you say that about any of the Doctors. I mean, they have their good episodes, they have their bad oh, episodes. Course. absolutely. Except for Colin, who unfortunately pretty much just had all bad episodes. I'm going to start Colin in two days. I heard nothing but garbage from these guys. But no, I'm, I'm like, but you know what we should do? Instead of bashing Colin, no, no, we're here. Let's talk about Trout. Yeah, and let's talk about Troughton as a doctor. I have not been on on a, a program where we have actually discussed Troughton in any context other than yeah. his appearance in the Two Doctors, of which I have not seen. Yeah, wh wh what I would say about Troughton is I think he is the doctor that all the other doctors look back up, or all the other actors look back upon first. Um, they, they even say, I mean, even a lot of the documentaries I've watched now that say, you know, he really is the doctor that has influenced the most of, of the modern doctors. Mm -hmm. and, and I can really, really see that. Um, In Matt Smith, particularly. Yeah, because well, he's scruffy and... Well, do you know which doctor first had jelly babies? Uh, yeah, Trouton. Trouton. Mm -hmm. Which doctor had, had the first sonic screwdriver? Trouton, right? In the yes. Fury, Fury of the Deep? Yeah, um, he originally also had a he, sonic hammer. Which doctor yeah. had an awesome recorder? He had a sonic. He had a sonic a toolkit. Was sonic what, toolkit. and only exists. And that episode doesn't exist anymore. There's a picture of it. Sure, that's about it. Um, but I mean, just the way he inter. I mean, honestly, I we were on a panel at um, or I was on a panel at RavenCon about how how would you reboot Doctor Who. Um, and then we ended up so on Doctor Who rebooted every time they have a new Doctor. Yeah, but I would say that really, this was the first true and only reboot of Doctor Who, because they had no idea what they were going to do. Sure. And this was a nobody else had ever tried anything like this. Sure. Um, and I think this was the tr first true reboot of a major property like this. Do you know? And I love this fact about Troughton. When Troughton was trying to figure out how to do this, and you're absolutely right, no one has yeah. done anything with this. Yeah. I mean, Doctor Who itself is a groundbreaking program. Yeah. Um, and I think it certainly benefited the show and the idea of regeneration, having Hartnell actually being a physically old man. He was old. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't even... It kind of boggles the mind that they go, hey, with the show. It's about a time-traveling grandpa that is just kind of a jerk. He'd catch you to everybody. And you really, you're not going to like him for the first two or three seasons. And then he's going to want to leave. Troughton said, well, you know, my first thought is I want to make him totally different yeah. from Hartnell. So I'm going to make him black. He goes, I'm going to make myself almost, uh, he was going to put black face on and give himself a vizier-like uh, <laughs> outfit. Um, and, and, and they said, no. Yeah. That's not a good idea. Because by 1967, blackface was going out of style. No, actually, it wasn't. Um, because the British still had... Oh, yeah, the British loved it. I'm thinking of an American. Oh, well, an American. But, but an American you, standpoint. I would be very surprised, and I would love to see this. Anybody who knows about this, please uh, send it to the website. Um, what the viewing in America was of Doctor Who, if Doctor Who even came over to the United States. I don't know when... I grew up with it on PBS. I have no um, idea when it came to the States. Honestly, I think it came to the States in the 70s with, with Baker. Yeah, that's right. the 70s. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, that's when it came over. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's about when it came over. They still had colored, color programs of uh, the blackface show. It was called... Oh, I'm, I'm failing this. I apologize. Uh... Uh, I will remember it and probably shout it out very loudly in, in a future part of this episode. But they had a show that, that, that was the whole point was a bunch of got white guys in, in yeah. blackface doing it. it wow. Well, no, blackface was huge. Like, after it lost its popularity in the U.S., it was huge in Hawaii and sure. Europe and everything else. Minstrel so. show. It was the minstrel show. Yeah. And it was actually called the minstrel show. Uh -huh. It was a bunch of Those gangly white Brits that were... being it's just embarrassing. But yeah, I'm embarrassed for all of you. But, but honestly, I will say Trouting is... Davison is my favorite. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you, um, Trouting is definitely, you know, taking that second that second um, 
that second spot in, in Classic Who for me. I mean, sure. he's just he's re just a really phenomenal actor. And I mean, I've been listening to a lot of the um, the soundtracks that still exist, and it just amazes me just the presence he had as mm -hmm. the Doctor, the way he played it. I mean, it just like we were talking about earlier. I hope they animate these these soundtracks in some way sure. so we could actually watch them. Well, of course, with the invasion, which is a six-parter, uh, and Troughton, uh, which is kind of the one that made the Cybermen. It's the first introduction of Unit. Yeah. It's the second appearance of Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. Um, it's a six-parter, and episodes, and I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe it was episodes four and six were missing, and they had the soundtracks, and they animated them in this um, particular style, whose name escapes me. And they're really good. They're actually quite enjoyable. Um, definitely recommend. That's probably one. Oh, they're we talking take about doing at. those for most of the, um, of the later DVDs that are coming out. I'll and I'm actually quite happy with it, though. And I would suggest this as an option for people who who are going to make these in the future. Please make the animations in both color and black and white, so we have the option of uh, even the animation itself kind of throws you, but then suddenly it's in color. Yeah. Uh, so you have this black and white, black and white, black and white episodes, and a color episode, then it goes back to black and white. And that's kind of jarring. I would like to see black and white animation. I know it's not necessary, and it's, of course we're, we're losing that palette with that. But I still think, come on, we have the technology here. We can, we can Yeah, yeah, yeah you know what the weird thing is? is like I, I, I watch you know, like Tomb of the Cybermen or any of the old Trout and stuff or the Hartnell stuff. You know, I don't even re register that they're in black and white. It's, it's just, true. It's just what they're filmed in. And, and like even with some of the cheesy effects, I don't even think about it because I know it's... I, I could I could take myself back. I have the mindset where you know I understand what they're going through, what they had budgetary wise, and I just I just let it go. I mean, sure. I just I just I'm just there for the ride, and it's amazing how they're able to encapsulate me into the story without even paying attention to this the stuff that's going wrong. Well, I think um, as fans of all aspects of the show, we can do that, and we've allowed ourselves. Yeah. So I think it re requires a certain amount of training. I will frequently admit. When I started with Hartnell, it, was, it got easier and easier mm -hmm. as the story progressed to, to bring myself in. I think if you take someone who's only watched the new Who, or, which is more likely the case, only the new uh, Matt Smith, and then yeah. said, hey, this is Tomb of the Cybermen. Let's yeah. watch this. They're going to be like, is it over yet? This is, whoa. I, and I think it's difficult. But it, it requires a certain amount of understanding. And I think See, one of the beauty of it, and just give me a second, yeah. is with the documentaries, yeah. kind of explaining the time and place, you're pulled in and it allows you to go, oh. I would, uh, the only reason why I would argue with that just a tad is um, with two of my earlier co-hosts, um, Clayton and Lacey, we had been watching the new stuff and then the first thing I showed them of Classic Who besides Unheard Earthly Child was um, Trounin's uh, War Games. And they got sucked right into it. I mean, they totally didn't. They totally forgot that it was black and white. I mean, they just they just took to it right away. But I think it's because they had seen the Matt Smith, mm -hmm. and then they're seeing Trouton. Yeah. And I think subconsciously their brain just picked have up on it. Have you already reviewed War Games? No, I okay. haven't. I have not. That that's an hour. That's well, it's a four hour long episode, uh, yeah. and that's it's at least an hour hour and a half long discussion of it because that. Is oh, the, the most important episode of Doctor Who up to that point. Oh, but, I, I I totally agree, and we, we need to do that episode. I think we do before the 50th anniversary starts. I yeah, absolutely. I mean, because because honestly, it is probably one of the most key episodes of Doctor Who, and I'm so glad we still have it in its entirety. Oh, I can't I can't imagine cannot imagine what it would be like without yeah. that episode. So, what do you think of Trotten as the Doctor? Trotten as the doctor, and it's kind of cool to have a doctor that's kind of just out there. Like, all of them have their little quirks, but I mean, when I, I just remember first seeing, like, pictures and stuff of Trotten, and I see it's actually what's on the side of the DVD. Okay, with this little recorder. Which you never see him play! Yeah, you know why? Why? Because all those episodes are gone. Are gone. gone. But, but it's just so But there's seven episodes that do quirky. exist, and I don't remember. The only time I see that is three doctors... And then Davison picks it up in uh, Legopolis for a brief moment, and that's it. I just love the recorder thing. It's just so quirky because his character's supposed to be like that raggedy, scraggly hobo guy, so... The raggedy doctor. The raggedy doctor. Yeah. He is kind of the original raggedy doctor. Yeah, but I also, say, I also say this about him. 
I think that's his uh, defense mechanism. As in, people see that, but in the back of his mind, he's he's already playing the chess game. Oh, absolutely. He is, yeah. I, I mean, m most definitely. So, um... For those of you who have seen the show before, I am watching it in linear progression. Um, I watched The Five Doctors the other day, which is not that great of an episode, but one of the beautiful things is, is you get Troughton back. Yeah. And Troughton has not aged. I mean, not no. really. Maybe a little here, but you bring him back almost 15 years later, and he just fits into the part. And... It's a fairly tepid episode, I will say, and, and I understand that not having Baker in there and having to do weird edits with Shada in there and all that, inf all that, and just kind of going uh, all the problems they had with it. But the moment Trouton gets on the screen, the show just kind of lights up, and it's it's Trouton and it's the Brigadier and the yeah. two of them together. Which, let's face it, really, if you're gonna if you're gonna team up the doc, yeah. the which doctor, I would team them up really with Pertwee and not Trouton, but. Well, I mean, well, with, with the way, of course, this is jumping the war games with what they did with Jamie. Of course. I mean, you really can't do that because honestly, if you, when I think of Trouton, I don't think of Ben and Polly. I don't. Oh, no, no, I no. don't think of Zoe. I don't think of Victoria. Unfortunately, I mean, you you think of Jamie. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but Jamie and Zoe, uh, to the, because I think she was the the second run. Yeah, and, and most of those surviving episodes, episodes, episodes are with, with yeah. the two of them. No, absolutely. Jamie is such a part of the history of what makes Doctor Who Doctor Who. And a lot of this goes into, and I know when we'll discuss yeah. um, something like uh, Unearthly Child, the importance of the companion in a role. Troughton actually may be the most pacifistic of, of the Doctors um, physically, because he has Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. And Jamie's just like, Jamie's like the early iteration of Leela. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'll stab it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, actually, and the, the, I'm going to bring this up when we talk about Unearthly Child. Moffat just said something very, very fascinating in a quote this past, or about two weeks ago, mm. which I cannot wait to read you. Okay. Because, I mean, <laughs> it, it goes almost that very, it addresses that very issue, but I want to I wanna save that for okay. another episode. Um, so, how, out of, out of five Gear Free Tardises, <laughs> um, how would you rate Tomb of the Cybermen? Four. I would give it four uh, out of Derpy Tarbuses, and mainly because when, if you're only giving it a system of, of five. Yes, of five. And I'm including things like, are we talking about compared to all Who no. or classic Who? This DVD set. That DVD you set. That DVD set. It has DVD all set. these awesome special features yes. everything. Okay. I haven't gotten to see that DVD yeah. set. I haven't gotten a chance to watch any of that. The episode itself, I'd give it a three and a half Derpy Tardises. I'm sure I would give it a four with all of that because what I want to do is, as, a, as a fan is appreciate the time period which it's in. So the more special features oh. you, you have... Uh, the better. So, you know, I have my favorite episodes of, yep. of The Doctor, and this may be my favorite Troughton, uh, other than War Games. I will say this. Um, this DVD set, I mean... It's worth the money. I would I would drop the money again, without a second thought. Um, right now, this is probably some of my favorite Troughton, next mm -hmm. to War Games. For me, this is definitely a, you know, I would spend my money in a heartbeat. This is... And this is really ever happened, but I, I think this is like a five Derpy Tardis uh, set. Mm. I mean, and, and that goes a long way because, I mean, I don't like parting 30 bucks for a DVD set, but this, hands down, I had no issue, and the more I watched, the more of the special features I watched, the more I was absolutely just like in seventh heaven watching this set. Cool. I look forward to yeah. stealing that from you yeah. and watching Well, I'll let myself. you borrow it after this episode. Let me let me oh, borrow it. Right. Let yeah, me, after your dinner, let me your... borrow it uh, after Heroes. Um, yeah. After I have, I, I I should be done by the twenty first of June. Yeah. And if everything is going according to my, I've watched just watching five episodes of Davison in two days or so. So I'm I'm ready to go on Baker and then McCoy. Okay. How, how would you rate? I think I'd give it four Derpy Tardises too, out of five. So so we're talking probably. Four and a half Derpy Tardises overall, four Derpy Tardises. I don't know, what, it's just, uh, let's say H13 divided by three is 
three derpy tardises. We'll round it up. So, so yes. if, if the if derpy tardis uh, uh, special yeah. effect appears under here, it would yeah. be one, two, three, four, and uh, a, a half, a, a half phased derpy yeah. tardis. So that's pretty good, you know. Yeah. Um, considering the time. Like I said, if, if you have the extra thirty bucks, if you want to see classic who, and I mean truly classic who at, at its finest, I mean, this is worth showing up the money for. The other thing is, if you are planning on watching all of Doctor Who, have fun. Um, you are going to see this a lot. This is not just classic, but this is influential classic. Oh, exactly. Almost everything that's in this you will see again, yeah. uh, especially when dealing with the Cybermen. Earthshock, finishing watching Earthshock made me want to watch this um, uh, a lot because yeah. they just went, wow, that's brilliant. So, yeah. here we go. So, um, any, any last words you'd like to say? No. So, this is uh, GPR signing off. Yeah. On our second uh, episode or review DVD, of review, DVD review of Classic Doctor Who. Let's go. Look at it on, on tonight. It's how to find you. Look at it on. Yes. Okay, just making sure. So do we just want to get a little bit closer, me and you? Neither sure, you right of here. course. Yes. I'd also like to say that I am, in fact, wearing pants. Guys, you suck. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. Are you? I'm not going to ask you anymore. We're professionals. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We are. Yeah. Promise. This, this will totally go at the end of the episode. <laughs> I've been having fun doing that, the after credits things. Okay. Are you good? I'm waiting on you guys to get ready. Come on now. <laughs> snap, snap. I don't know what we're, I, I don't even know what we're doing here. I don't need, wait, that actually hit the record button. Yeah, it's flashing red. Awesome. You are just. Professionals at work. <laughs> okay, so we're actually starting the episode in yeah, like three. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, actually, what are we doing? Which Two one are we doing first? Two. Two. Okay. okay. So. Okay.